Jesus. Jai. So first, just before we do anything, I will begin with our Mangala Charna as always. Om Agyanati Mirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Shtapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Prashtati Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vancha Kalpatarupyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanepyo Vaishnavepyo Namo Namaha So I felt really kind of eager uh, to get started as quickly as possible. Uh, today is going to be hopefully extremely fun and very exciting. Uh, we've been doing lecture series on, on many personalities. We've been speaking about so many different uh, wonderful spiritual teachers and people that we get wonderful, incredible lessons from. And today is going to be no different. And as Ram Nomi just passed, and as the upcoming full moon on Saturday, is going to be very, very auspicious and extremely important. I thought that we would talk about one such Vaishnav who has such a connection to both of these days. Um, this Vaishnav is the emblem of service. When we talk about the nine processes of bhakti, we've got Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam Padasevanam Chanam Vandanam Dasyam Sakyam Atma Nivedanam So we've got all nine, right? And we've got the emblem of, of Dasyam or, or servitorship which is none other than Sri Hanuman. When we last left off on our previous lecture we were speaking about Murari Gupta we heard some very astonishing and very wonderful stories about Murari Gupta. And we heard that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was speaking to Sanatan Goswami. And he tells him that, oh, don't worry, you know, you've had, we've had these previous experiences because his brother Anupam could not give up chanting the name of Raghunath, the name of Sri Ramachandra. He says, don't worry, a similar experience has been had by our Murari Gupta. And we spoke about how Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells Murari Gupta, Oh Murari, you should chant the name of Krishna. Murari Gupta tries and tries and finally he thinks, better that I give up my life than to give up the name of, of Sri Ram. I've tried chanting this name of Krishna as you've suggested, but it's not working. Every time I try to chant Krishna, just simply somehow the name of Ram emerges. What do I do? I'm trying to follow your order, but now I feel as though I've lost my very existence. He says, Murari, no problem. I can tell by this, by this one instance and, and many others, you are really Hanuman. Uh, and so this full moon upcoming is celebrated as one of two Hanuman Jayantis. Anuman is one such personality. So amazing, he has two celebrations. And we, there were some requests at the very, very end. We have more stories about Hanuman. And that was, was already kind of in the works. So, uh, And because Ram Nomi just passed, what better way to spend this Akadashi than hearing about the glorious service and pastimes of Sri Hanuman? So... 
who is Hanuman? Hanuman is none other than an expansion of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is found one day to be having a most unique kirtan on Mount Kailash. And the kirtan of Lord Shiva actually happens often. Uh, but he's having a very unique kirtan. And Lord Shiva is so fond of chanting the name of Ram. So incredibly fond of chanting the name of Ram. And so this one day he's having this wonderful kirtan and he's singing the glories of Ram. Raghunath, Raghunandan. And finally, all of the inhabitants on Mount Kailash arrive to join in with Mahadev's kirtan. And whenever Mahadev has these wonderful kirtans, everyone participates. They play instruments. Mahadev dances. They all dance. And they say that Parvati has a very specific and special place and role that she she uses in, in order to support these kirtans. It says that she claps expertly, which I always thought was very sweet because if you think of yourself in a kirtan, you have the kirtan leader, you have murdanga players, you have kartal players, you have all kinds of different players, and I've got violin players and drum players, this player, that player, all kinds of different things. And sometimes you can forget how wonderful clapping accompaniment is. And so whenever I'm in a kirtan now, and I find myself clapping, I think back to the, the kirtans on Mount Kailash. One, how amazing they would be. Can we imagine Lord Shiva chanting kirtan? I mean, as a kirtaniya, there, there are a few times where you think to yourself, okay, there's a few kirtans that we'd like to experience, right? I, I don't necessarily have a bucket list for life, but if I had a bucket list for kirtans that I'd like to just kind of bear witness to, it's definitely one of them. The kirtans of Lord Nityananda are another. These are the, the kinds of kirtans, the kirtans of the inhabitants of Vrindavan. Can we imagine the kirtan of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? The, the explanations of Bhagavatam of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. These are things like bucket list, transcendental bucket list. Uh, so whenever I'm in kirtan and I think about how can I participate best? And sometimes when I feel like you have nothing else to do, we can always clap. Even if you think, oh, I don't have the best voice, I don't have the, we can always clap. And when everyone claps, it's, I always think about Parvati Devi and I beg, beg for blessings. Bless us so that we can please our Supreme Person just by clapping. Srila Prabhupada would say when you are in front of the deities and you clap, just as birds fly away by the loud noise of clapping. You ever go and you clap near a, a ton of pigeons that we have in New York? If you go and you clap by those pigeons, they all they start to fly away. It says in that same way, all of our sins by the by the loud noise ushered in by the chanting of the holy name and the clapping accompaniment, all of our sins fly away. So my mom always would tell me this from the time I was little. So clapping has become something that is so amazing and so wonderful. Kirtan is something that anyone and everyone can do. They would say that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would go and throughout forests, throughout so many different places, he would chant loudly the holy name. And what they would hear is an echo. Right? You ever go to some place and you chant loudly and you hear a beautiful echo. It's always one of those like really cool natural things that makes you want to do something more. In fact, I mean, the uh, the cowherd boys of Vrindavan, as cowherd boys do, because boys will be boys, they go and they find caves with the most perfect echoes. And then Srila Prabhupada says they'd go to those caves and they'd shout curses. <laughs> curses. <laughs> So uh, recently, we were walking, my family and I, we decided to go and walk and we were at the 
Brooklyn Pier. And they have a series of pipes there near a passageway filled with mirrors. I know it sounds really mystical. It felt really mystical because we were there and no one else was there. It was kind of cold. There weren't that many people there. We were all just kind of like, we walked in, all these mirrors and benches and all these interesting looking seats that look like you should have a, a conclave of the gods. You know, it was very, it was very interesting to, to find in Brooklyn. Uh, and there were all a series of pipes and they were kind of built like speakers. So if you speak in one pipe, the sound would come everywhere else. And I was joking with one of my nephews about it. I said, now the cowherd boys, they find a place like this. They'd go and they'd start cursing through it <laughs> and then hear the echo come out in so many different parts because boys are so silly. And uh, what my nephew actually did was he, we went to the different speakers and we were kind of like talking to each other, just kind of testing it out. Can you hear me? And somebody would respond way over there. I can. And all of a sudden, I heard a beautiful Ayindra Kirtan come through the speaker. One of my nephews had taken his phone and kind of put it through the speaker. And then you could hear it in so many different parts that weren't even near one another. And so Mahaprabhu would go to many, many different places and chant the holy name loudly so that there would be this echo. And he would tell the devotees, this is not just an echo. What you are hearing is the answering response, Kirtan, of the unmoving living entities. So I think about that in this concrete jungle where there are so many unmoving living entities, right? Sri, Sri Prahlad Maharaj tells his father, Krishna is everywhere. He's even within the atom. He is within the most minute portion of existence. So if Krishna is there, then Paramatma is there. If Paramatma is there, then even the unmoving living entities, even within this concrete jungle, can give the most wonderful answering kirtan in the form of glorious, wonderful echoes. So if you've ever thought you want to serve the holy name, all it takes is us going through different places and chanting and remembering that that echo is not merely just some sound vibration miracle happening. This is the answer in Kirtan of all of the unmoving living entities. So everyone, anyone can perform Kirtan. So Lord Shiva is performing Kirtan on Mount Kailash. Parvati Devi is clapping. All of the inhabitants are, are joining in. We've got echoes going. We've got all kinds of things happening. And finally, Parvati Devi asks, why are you so excited? You seem to have such a, a, a different level today. My Lord is coming soon. There is much to be done. I must go help. Everyone is taking birth in order to go and help the Lord in his mission. I too will go. Parvati Devi says, oh, how will you go? Lord Shiva thinks, I want a form that will be able to do anything and everything in the service of my Lord. And therefore, I'll go as a monkey. Parvati Devi is a little astonished. A monkey? This is unusual. And while her Lord is not unused to unusual things, this is the Lord of Mount Kailash with the most wonderful, perfect form. He's like the emblem of masculinity. My Lord will take the form of a monkey? Yes, Devi. You see, monkeys, and as celestial monkeys are wont to do, monkeys are not used to living by the rules of humans. They can make their own rules. They make their own way. And because they make their own rules and they make their own way, I want to have such an attitude when it comes to serving my Lord. I don't want there to be any hindrances. If I need to run off and serve my Lord at a moment's notice, I want to go. I don't want to live by any of these man-made rules which now this sounds exactly in line with who Lord Shiva is. He doesn't really care for anybody else's rules. He says, I'll take the form of a monkey, a very celestial monkey. And this line of monkeys, these celestials are called Vanaras, forest dwelling, supernatural, superhero monkeys. 
And so Parvati Devi says, my Lord, I want to go with you. Lord Shiva says, Devi, not this time. This time I feel like there's so much to be done, so many places to go. I'm not sure if the protection that I can afford you will be there. I'm going to do a lot. I intend to do the most. And I want to dedicate myself fully in service to my Lord who is who is arriving in an unprecedented form as Lord Sri Ram. Parvati Devi says, hmm, no problem. As the wife is the ornament and the crown jewel on all of the of the personality, as all of the traits of the husband. Let me be the crown jewel of this monkey. I will take the form of your tail. And so we see that Hanuman has a very long, luxurious, wonderful tail, can extend at will, magical properties. This is none other than Shakti herself. The, 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 very, the very power of Lord Shiva. And so this is Hanuman. And Hanuman Jayanti falls very close to Ram Nomi, as it should be. And it is said that Hanuman, the birth story of Hanuman can span several classes. In fact, it does. My Guru Maharaj has given several lectures on the birth stories of Hanuman and all of them are two hours long or so. And they're all wonderful, wonderful, wonderful accounts one such account comes about from the churning of the milk ocean. The Samudra Mantan, demigods and demons decide that they need nectar of immortality. Actually, the demigods needed it more than the demons because the demigods through, unfortunately, a misstep by Devindra, the king of the demigods, they'd lost their wealth, their vitality, their homes, so much, uh, which we can kind of think, well, I mean, there are so many demons constantly conquering the heavenly planets. Aren't they used to it? But they'd lost all of their wealth and their homes and their vitality. They go and they pray to Lord Vishnu, how can we get it back? Lord Vishnu says, well, you can churn this milk ocean. And when you churn this milk ocean, you'll get all of the things back. However, first you need to make a truce with the demons. Oh. The demons at this point were headed by Maharaj Bali. Yes, the very same Bali who will be benedicted by Lord Vamana. So he says, you must make a truce with the demons. However, give them whatever they ask for. Tell them you'll give them a share of the nectar. Give them whatever they ask for. Do not argue. Because in order to gain exactly what you need, and in order to perform this, this tapasya, this austerity, a key of performing devotional tapasya in order to get what you need devotionally and materially is that you have to be calm. You cannot get angry. It kind of causes us to lose our intelligence, do things that we normally wouldn't say or do, right? Sri Krishna even says within Bhagavad Gita, from contemplating the objects of the senses, lust develops from lust. When lust goes unfulfilled, then you get anger. From anger, you get loss of memory, you get bewilderment. I've actually seen it in action. It works. I've had, used to, when I was a college counselor, I had coworkers and there was a coworker. He wanted a day off and he really needed that day off. When he went to the supervisor and asked for the day off, the supervisor didn't give it. It turned into an argument. And next thing you know, this co-worker was off shouting and saying things to a supervisor that they shouldn't say and that he would never have done before. And then this co-worker had a habit of coming and speaking to me. This co-worker was kind of atheistically agnostic. So he was kind of like, eh, I've had my fill of religions and maybe there's something out there. I just, I kind of don't know what it is. And uh, I'm not really interested in finding out. But this coworker would kind of sit in the cubicle right behind me. And every day at some point, 
They would go and they'd sit down at their desk and they'd say, ah, oh, ah, oh, Chuta. And sometimes at the very beginning, when I was first working, I'd say yes. And I maybe about three days in the coworker said, no, I kind of just like your name, just saying it. And I'd always smile. It's the glory of my parents. Good job. Because Achuta is none other than a name of Lord Krishna. And funny enough, of all the people who have ever said my name, he always said it with like perfect pronunciation and clarity. Not one syllable mumbled or garbled. The very same day, he did the same thing. I said, yes. <laughs> he said, no, it's just one of those days. Just, just stay in it. I said, oh, okay. And then I asked him, I said, what, what was happening? Because you couldn't not hear the interaction. And he said, honestly, I don't know. He's like, I don't know. I got really angry. I can't even tell you what I said. I don't even remember. He said, but now I'm kind of just wondering what's going to happen and how I'm supposed to now like go and apologize for this whole big deal. And I went and I was sitting kind of in my cubicle, pulled up that verse. And I remember looking at it and going, this is like science, it's textbook stuff. The material world works exactly the way Krishna said it would. Who knew? You know, from contemplating the objects of the senses, this one desire comes in, he needs a day off. That was a legitimate desire, but from when lust goes un, un, unserved, anger comes. From anger, you get bewilderment of memory. Intelligence is lost. One falls back down into the material pool. Intelligence is completely taken. He doesn't even remember. And so uh, finally, it, it all did work out. But, so we see uh, this, this, you can't get angry. And so they go, they decide, they churn the, the milk ocean. So many things happen. The nectar of immortality does come. All the riches do come. But as soon as the nectar of immortality comes, the demons snatch it from the hands of our celestial Danvantari, who's also an expansion of Lord Vishnu which we'll have to get into that past time again, because it's an example of how Lord Vishnu is doing the most, everything. And we will discuss that because that was one of the first lectures I gave at the beginning of the pandemic. My dear friend, Doyle Goranga said, hey, Chuta, have you ever given a lecture? Do you want to give one for the Bhakti Center on Zoom? I said, okay. And it was on the subject. That was one of the first lectures I ever gave. So we'll have to see how we fit that in. So Danvantari arrives, they snatch the nectar and everyone is in an uproar. What do we do? Oh my Lord, you promised us. The Lord then takes a very wonderful and mystical form, the form of Mohini Murti, takes the form of a goddess. This one is a little bit different. We've heard how he's taken the form of a, a goddess expands from the body of Lord Vishnu and that is none other than Ekadashi Devi herself. But now this Mohini Murti speaks to the, dem the demons and the demigods. Oh, my dear sirs, you seem to have a dilemma. What seems to be the issue? We have nectar. Everybody wants it. What do we do? The demons are completely enthralled. Whatever you say will take as law. She says, why don't you give the nectar to me? I'll make sure that I distribute it properly and equally amongst both sides. No problem. Take it. And they're so eager for all of this nectar. And they're cupping their hands. And as Lord Vishnu is wont to do, he gives the nectar to the demigods and mystically switches out the pots when he gets to the demons and they get really good tasting juice. But no nectar. And so finally, long story short, one particular very smart minded, right? demon named Rahu kind of sees what's going on and he says, ah, this doesn't seem right. Also, who is this Mohini Murti? Why are we trusting her? So he thinks, I'll take the form of a demigod. And he goes and sits on the demigod's side and he gets to drink the nectar. But finally, there is someone who says, hey, hey, that's not a demigod. And Mohini Murti immediately invokes the Sudarshan Chakra of Lord Vishnu. After all, she is Lord Vishnu herself. And she cuts off the head of Rahu 
But Rahu had already drunk the nectar of immortality. So now what happens? Rahu becomes a planet. And Rahu becomes the, the cause of eclipses. Both lunar and solar. Rahu gets a benediction. You can swallow the sun and the moon for your sustenance. You can have appointed times. And thus we have the causes of eclipses in Rahu. Right? Why am I telling this story in connection with Hanuman? Here we go. Lord Shiva hears about this mystical form of Mohini Murti. He says, my Lord, you took this wonderful form never before seen, but I missed it. You see, I was doing service. You called upon me to swallow the poison that had churned up from the beginnings of this churning of this milk ocean. It was threatening the entire universe. I stepped in and said, I will do the needful. And I swallowed the poison, but because I was engaged in service, and then I went off to do penance and cool myself and calm myself because this poison is incredibly hot and he holds it in his throat, which is then forever marked by a blue line. And then Lord Shiva is forever known as Nilakant. Oh, blue-throated, blue-necked one. Also another reason that Lord Shiva is forever known as Nilakanta because he loves chanting the glories of Sri Krishna. I think we've spoken about this before. And as Sri Krishna is a beautiful deep dark blue color, because he is always engaged in chanting, his neck takes on this deep dark blue color. Not unlike Mother Jashoda. Mother Jashoda happens to be the beautiful deep dark blue color of her son Krishna. And they say, as Yashoda Rani had Krishna within her womb, she also takes on this color. And some might say, well, wasn't she also blue before? Yes, but she gets much, yeah, that is a color closer to her son. So in association of chanting the holy names, we can see how the attributes, the effulgence, some of the opulences of our dear Supreme Lord come upon the devotees who've taken to chanting the holy names. So when you see these devotees and they're wonderful and they're sparkling and they're effulgent, and I always remind myself, ah, don't, don't get it twisted, don't get caught up. What I'm actually seeing is just a hint of the effulgence of my Govinda. So Lord Shiva is forever marked with a blue line on his throat, both from this act of service of swallowing this poison for the good of the entire universe and through chanting the holy names. So my Lord, I missed the form that everyone else got to see. Can you show it to me? Lord Vishnu says, I don't think this is a good idea. He looks at all assembled. Parvati Devi is there. He says, I don't, I don't know if this is a good idea. Lord Shiva says, but my Lord, I, I must see. I yearn to see this form. And because Lord Shiva is so dear to Lord Vishnu, he says, well, my dearest commands, okay. And so without another word, Lord Vishnu vanishes. Everyone thinks, where did he go? And they see a woman playing with a ball in the distance. She's so amazingly beautiful and all attractive. As our Lord is, Lord Shiva takes off running after her, abandons his wife, abandons all regular company, takes off after, runs and runs and she runs and runs and he runs and runs and she runs and he runs and she runs and he runs and all kinds of things happen. And finally, just he runs through so many different places, right? He runs through ashrams, holy places, different kinds of ashrams, ashrams where there are sages practicing perfect celibacy, and focusing on the Lord of Tapasya, who is none other than Lord Shiva, the perfect yogi who is completely detached and has nothing to do with any of this worldly material life. And then comes this woman running through their ashram. What's happening? And so what do holy people say when you see something like almost like undesirable? Oh, Shiva, Shiva. This woman has come to disturb my son. She's running off. Let me focus my mind. But then who comes running after her is Lord Shiva. So now everybody's bewildered. What is happening? So he goes running and finally they say, just as he reaches out, he kind of touches her hair, it touches her shoulder and she disappears. And then it is said that 
some of the essence of Lord Shiva drops. This essence gets carried and carried through many, many mystical channels. This essence is almost too hot for the earth to hold because this is the potency of Lord Shiva. Not just anybody can handle this. So it gets carried and carried and dropped and moved by the Ganga and carried on different so many places and falls into the lap of a Vanari named Anjana. And this Vanari happens to become the mother of Hanuman. And I like this story most because it's almost through the connection of Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu comes this expansion known as Hanuman. No wonder, no wonder he's so amazing. No wonder he's the emblem of all strength. And also because he's carried through the wind, he's considered to be the son of Vayu, the wind god. So then he's forever known as the elder brother of Bhimasen, the illustrious Pandava, who is also the son of the wind god. So no wonder we have our Hanuman who's so bent on serving in any way possible. It is said that when Hanuman was in the, within the womb of Anjana, uh, there was a decree that a very powerful Vanara would be born. And so many people get hint of it. One of them is Bali or Vali. Right? Not to be confused with the Bali who was the Daityaraj, right? King of the demons. This is Vali, the Vanara, brother of Sugriva. And Vali hears that there is going to be this great Vanara born. He thinks, well, is he going to challenge me from my position of power? Because he was king of all the Vanaras and Kishkindakshetra and all of this. You know, he had a wonderful forest kingdom. Let me protect my, my, my throne. And so he shoots Astras at the womb of Anjana, they actually enter the womb. But when they're faced with Hanuman's effulgence, they kind of melt away and they become beautiful earrings that Hanuman wears always. And we hear within Hanuman Chalisa that Hanuman has beautiful golden celestial earrings. These become the earrings and the ornaments of Hanuman. This is how much of a boss Hanuman is. Even the Astras bow down before him. And so when Hanuman is born, he is a boisterous monkey, which if anyone knows anything about Western astrology, makes sense, All right? We're still kind of in the midst of Aries season. Aries is very fiery, passionate, impatient, forward moving at all times. This is Hanuman, it's definitely Hanuman ready to go off at a, at a moment's notice, no matter what. So this is, Hanuman is a very wonderful, boisterous young monkey. And his mother tells him, you can have any fruit you like. Hanuman looks and sees so many fruits. Oh, this is like a dream. Kid in a candy shop. So fond of so many fruits. Then he looks up into the sky. He sees what looks like an emerging, bright, beautiful, juicy, huge mango. Hanuman thinks, my mother said I can have any fruit I like. That looks like a fruit. Let's go get it. And so Hanuman leaps off. And the thing about these Vanaras, is they have incredible superpowers, supernatural strength, supernatural speed, supernatural abilities. They can leap very far in a single bound. And so Hanuman decides, let me leap to this fruit. This fruit is not a fruit, it's the sun. Hanuman doesn't care, right? This is exactly what Lord Shiva wanted. I wanted to be able to do anything and everything. So he jumps off after the sun. That day also happened to be an eclipse. So as Hanuman is coming to the sun from one direction, Rahu is coming at the sun at another direction. And so just before Hanuman gets to the sun, because now the sun is thinking, whoa, what's happening? This is not approved. Like at universally, who approved this? What's happening? Why are there two speeding beings coming at me? And then Hanuman sees Rahu. He says, oh, are you some kind of fruit? So Hanuman changes direction. Let me go get that fruit. That fruit looks very, very interesting. I've never seen a fruit like that. 
And so now Hanuman is chasing after Rahu. And my Guru, Guru Maharaj says, Rahu ran. Rahu is running to all the demigods. He's running to Indra. Indra, save me. Indra arrives on the scene on his Airavata, his wonderful mystical ele elephant with very, very many tusks. Hanuman sees Airavata and thinks, your fruit too? Runs after that fruit. Airavata now is also thinking, Indra, save me. Now Indra is thinking, well, what to do? This baby monkey is flying all over and causing so many disturbances. Indra takes his thunderbolt and shoots it at Hanuman. Which I'm thinking, it's almost like getting a bat for a fly. Why? Why are we do Anyway, so he sees he's this little baby monkey is flying after so many fruits, takes his celestial thunderbolt, shoots it at Hanuman, hits little Hanuman on the chin. Hanuman goes hurtling back to the earth and falls unconscious. This is a very big problem because when you are the son of the wind god, now the wind god takes personal offense when you mess with someone's kids, whew, it's a problem. Don't do it. The parents get irrational. And so Vayu thinks, Indra has hit my child and now my child is lying lifeless in a cave? No problem. I will withdraw my energy and my potency from the entire universe. And Vayu withdraws the wind. How does anyone exist without air? Right, we've written songs about it that sound really romantic. Can't breathe without you. No, really, we can't breathe without you. It's a problem. And so everyone was having acute asthmatic issues. No one can breathe. Apparently, according to yoga science, you need air within your joints in order to move. It's what causes arthritis, apparently. Who knew? So no one can move, no one can breathe. And my Guru Maharaj likes to point out because uh, my Guru Maharaj is, he has a wonderful childlike nature. And if you've been in, in any series of lectures with Radnath Maharaj at some point, he's gonna talk about bodily movements, like bowel movements. It's very interesting. And he, there's a glee. There's a light that enters his eyes, there's a glee. He's suddenly decades younger. And I'm always like, yeah, uh, you know, sometimes you can almost time it. You wait for it. You're like, oh, I haven't heard it in a couple of that. Uh, there it is. So he says, apparently, according to Ayurveda, in order to have any kind of bowel movements, you need air within your body. You need the air to circulate. Your life airs need to move. So nobody has any life airs moving. Now everybody's constipated. It's a big problem. Everybody in the universe is now saying, what do we do? They go to Lord Brahma and he says, well, you hit this baby. This Pavana Putra, this Vayu Putra, this Anjana Sutta, you hit this baby. He becomes known as Hanuman because he is hit on the chin by the thunderbolt of Indra. So Hanuman is like one whose chin is broken. So that's how he becomes to be known as Hanuman. He then also becomes to be known as Bajrangabali, one who is as strong as a thunderbolt. Well, because now everybody's fearing for their very lives. What do we do? How do we appease Vayu? Huh? Well, go and give your choicest blessings and apologize. Everyone goes, everyone goes, and they give blessings to Hanuman. Agni says, never will you be threatened by fire. Lord Brahma says, if you want, you can be as long lived as even me. I grant you with a long life. Yamaraj says, you will never fear my rod of punishment. Indra says, just as I hit you with my thunderbolt, you will become as strong as that very thunderbolt. So many people come, they say, you will never be taken over by any kind of disease. There will never be any weapon that will ever be able to cause you harm. Lord Vishnu arrives and says, I promise you, you will become the best devotee. So everybody gives their choicest blessings to Hanuman. He revives his consciousness. Vayu is pleased. 
He restores the wind to the universe. Everyone is pleased. And now we think problem solved, right? No, no. The problem was this monkey was too boisterous to begin with. He was jumping after the sun. So now he's got boons and benedictions and more superpowers than he had before. He's terrorizing everyone. Sages are taking bath and he's splashing them with water and pulling their beards and tying their beards together and ripping their clothes to shreds. And they're thinking, what do we do? Because they learned from the first time, you can't just go and do anything. You can't just go and take retali retaliatory action against Hanuman because they, they saw what happened. So lovingly, they pronounced a curse on Hanuman. May all of your powers be bound and lay dormant unless someone reminds you. And then they all made a pact. No one remind him until it is the right time, until it becomes necessary. And then Hanuman's boisterous nature was much more calmed and subdued. Then he was willing to help everyone. Then he was the emblem of service. He'd go and make sure wood was there for sages, he'd help them, make sure their ashrams were clean, so well behaved, so nice. And he grows up and he helps, he becomes commander uh, of Sugriva's army. It's another long story, Ramayan can span, they have so many, they have days and days of Ramayan Katha. We could spend our whole lives speaking Ramayan Katha and never get tired of the many, 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 many details. There is one such being who has seen Ramayan so many times. Jambavan happens to be one of the oldest living beings created. It is said that he is created from Lord Brahma. I think it is the perspiration of Lord Brahma. He is like one of the second things created. Jambavan. And so because Jambavan has such a long lifespan, he's actually seen Ramayana occur in so many different kalpas. And so Jambavan travels with this group of monkeys. Jambavan is a creature unto himself. He is known as a riksha, riksharaj, which is a, a man beast being that has never before been seen or since. India's cinema puts him in the category of kind of a bear, but it's because we don't really know what he was like. And he's, it's one of those Sanskrit terms that has no English equivalent for what Jambavan was. And he's a race all unto himself because he's one of the second beings created alone. And so Jambavan has seen Ramayan occur so many times. And so in some cases he journeys with all of these monkeys and these vanaras and he kind of mumbles to himself, oh yeah, this is how good this is going to happen. Mm -hmm, this will happen. And all the monkeys, what, what did you say, Hanuman? Uh, what did you say, Jambavanji? Oh, don't worry, I'm old, he would tell them. So I often mumble to myself. But it's because he knows the outcome. <laughs> He's seen these things happen so many times. And so in a wonderful, well-known pastime, Hanuman receives the ring of Lord Ram. Lord Ram says, oh, Hanuman, I believe if anyone can find my lost Sita, because if we've heard anything about Ramayan, we've heard that Ram lost Sita. She was kidnapped. So he says, if anyone can find my Sita or find her whereabouts, it will be you. They travel all the way through India. They come to the Southern seashore and they think we still haven't found her. All of the Vanara soldiers are thinking, oh no, how can we return back? Sugriva gave us a period of 30 days in order to find her, and that has long since come and gone. We can't return because Sugriva will kill us. Also, we can't return because who can bear to face Lord Ram and tell him, we failed? So they think, better we sit here and end our lives. And Hanuman is thinking, sit here and end our lives? What kind of plan is that? Why are we stopping the search? We should keep going. And they said, well, do you have a better idea? What should we do? He's like, oh. Actually, I don't know. I don't know how to get through this, but I know that the, the, the key is not to stop searching. And they decide we're going to fast till death. I can't, we can't. So Hanuman thinking, well, what, how do I motivate these troops? He sits and he thinks and he becomes very morose. They 
happened to me to vulture this vulture says oh people are fasting till death good i have to work less for my meal usually i have to wait a long time but now look it's a whole army of monkeys fasting till death easy pickings yes go through with your plan and so he kind of just kind of meanders throughout the ranks of monkeys, you know, waiting. You ever hear like the vultures were circling. This vulture wasn't circling, just kind of walking, just waiting. And they're all speaking about their predicament. They're speaking about so many, just as, just as the great vulture Jatayu gave up his life in the service of Ram, we too shall give up our lives. And this vulture says, wait, who said Jatayu? And they're thinking, whoa, where did you come from? Because he's a very big vulture. And he says, who spoke of Jatayu? That happens to be my brother. My name is Sampati. Who spoke of Jatayu? Where is my brother? And they tell him, unfortunately, he gave up his life in the service of Sri Ram, trying to protect Sita from a great demon named Ravan. Ravan? I saw him fly this way. If I had known that he had done away with my brother, I never would have let him fly this way. You know Ravan? Where did he go? He went to his kingdom. It's right across the sea. Well, how do you know? He says, well, due to a long ago incident of saving my brother's life, I lost the ability to fly. My wings were burnt up by the sun. But I can see really far because he's a mystical vulture. Because he's talking, you see. Uh, mystical vulture. He says, I can see really far. And across the sea, I can see the great kingdom of Lanka. And within the kingdom of Lanka, I can see there's a woman. And so Ravana came flying this way with a woman. She was crying out to some Ram, which I'm supposing is the same Ram you speak of. He deposited her in his kingdom and there they are. I say, well, now we've found out the whereabouts of Sita Devi. But how can we get across the sea? 800 miles. Maybe we can build a bridge. Do you know how long that will take? That's not a good idea. We can't build a bridge right now. We have to get across quickly. So many people say, I can I can kind of jump halfway, but not the full way. And that's how celestial these monkeys are. These are not Hanuman monkeys, but they're still Vanaras. I can jump halfway, 800 miles. I can't jump four inches off the ground. I can jump halfway. I can jump. Angad says, I can get there the whole way, but I can't jump back. I'll be too tired. Jambavan says, you can't go anyway. You're the crown prince of the Vanara dynasty. We can't lose you. Everybody thinks, well, what do we do? Jambavan says, of course, there's one among you who can go. Hanuman, don't you remember who you are? Hanuman says, I don't think I can go at all. I, I don't know. I don't remember anything. Don't you remember who you are? You are the same monkey who would jump to the sun to try and eat it as a mango. You are endowed with all wonderful possibilities. You are endowed with all mystical qualities. Don't you remember? You got this spoon and this spoon and this spoon and this spoon and this spoon. And finally, Hanuman feels something stirring within him. Something like a memory. But there were black holes in his memory. I can't remember anything. And all of a sudden, everything comes flooding back. Hanuman says, I do remember. But now the key to Hanuman's powers are not just any will or whim. The key now to activating Hanuman's powers, yes, of course I can do it. With the, with the chanting of the Lord's names on my lips, I can do anything in the service of my Lord. And with a roar, Hanuman shouts a beautiful mantra, super simple, Jai Shri Ram. Hanuman begins to expand in size. He grows taller than the mountains in the area. And then Hanuman takes off with an astounding leap with shakes the mountains and all of the animals get a little disturbed. Her herbs go hiding and popping out, doing all kinds of things. Mountain shakes, he uproots it. But all the monkeys are super happy. Go Hanuman, go, may you be victorious. And this Jambavan, who is none other than created by Lord Brahma, becomes the guru of Hanuman. So Hanuman goes in an astounding tale that I'll end with. He goes across the sea, meets with so many obstacles, both good and bad. As my Guru Maharaj says, there's one obstacle in the form of a mountain of oh, Hanuman. 
You've been traveling for so long. Just take rest. And one says, I can't. My Lord is waiting. And Hanuman had seen the agony of Lord Ram. Lord Ram spent four months in a cave called Malayavanta. In the Ramayana, it's called Prashravan. In a cave of a mountain on the outskirts of Kishkinda because he wouldn't go into the city. And for four months of the rainy season where there were monsoons that flooded Kishkinda Kshetra and, and Lake Pampa, and all of these, these different places, the water swelled, no one could do anything. Sri Ram sat in that cave and with japa beads, he recited the name of Sita for four months. He didn't eat, he didn't sleep, he refused to drink. He simply sat with one hand on his heart, the other hand with his japa mala, chanting the name of his beloved. Hanuman had seen this agony. He thought, how can I, how can I stop? So my Guru Maharaj categorizes this as a good obstacle. Sometimes we think, let me take a rest from the service. You know, I've done so much. But Hanuman thinks, I can't. My Lord is waiting. Just imagine if we thought, my Lord is waiting eager for my service. But he doesn't want to dishonor. Now this mountain coming for a good cause. He touches the mountain, honors it, and goes on. Gets to the, the city of Lanka, and finds himself with another barrier. There is a woman. She's very interesting looking, but very big. She goes inside and she says, who are you? And he says, I am Hanuman. I've come to, to on the mission of my Lord Ram to find Sita Devi because Hanuman is nothing but eager and truthful. I've come on a mission to find Sita Devi. She says, who are you? You can't come here. And in a wonderful display of power, she says, I am Lankini. I am the guardian goddess of this city. I protect its gateways. No one can get through me. You insignificant monkey. And she slaps Hanuman. Oh, we've seen the problems with slapping nowadays, huh? It's a big issue. So she slaps Hanuman. Hanuman, uh, as he's wont to do, and my Guru Maharaj says, this is a great lesson. If you are ever a Madhaji who thinks that you can slap a Brahmachari, because Hanuman is such a Brahmachari. In the service of Sri Ram, Hanuman says, Jai Sri Ram, and punches her in the face. And Lankini falls down on the ground, a little bit unconscious. Then she gathers back her consciousness, gets up and stands up and says, very good. I was waiting for such a day. He says, what? What's happening? She says, I was cursed. I had to stand here and guard this city for so long. But Lord Brahma said, when the day comes that a monkey comes and punches you in the face and you fall unconscious, then you will know that the end of Lanka is near. Give up your post. And so she says, I'm so eager to give up this post. She takes the form of a beautiful goddess and says, oh, Hanuman, I bless you with all victory. Go, 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 go. Take over the city. Go. And that's where we'll end with Hanuman. Shri Hanuman ki jai. Pavanaputra Hanuman ki jai. Shri, Badrabang, Shri Badrangabali ki jai. This is our Hanuman, always ready and willing to do anything in order to serve. And so we'll continue with more Hanuman Kata next to Kadashi because why not? Ananda Bihari, you're still muted. <laughs> Hare Krishna, I just, uh, I admire how Achuta Gopi uh, backs up her points by, why not? Why not? I like that. I'm taking this. <laughs> Thank you, Achuta Gopi. It was like a movie. Great, transcendental movie. Thank you very much. You're our movie star, backed up by uh, Radha Govindaji and uh, Baby Krishna. Is that Baby Krishna? That's Lord Shiva. <laughs> Baby Shiva, okay, good. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Susan, Angel, Bhima Prabhu. You're, you're Hanuman's brother, Bhima. 
Andrea, Jamuna Jaya. Jamuna Jaya is very intimately related with Hanuman. We know, we know that. Isabel, Suzanne, Henry, Nayana Manjari, Pat, Angelika, Lileshvari, Lileshvari, Hare Krishna, Arkiko Chan, Preeti Chaturvedi, uh, Narayani. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Narayani, Preeti Kartik, Sharita, Jason Prabhu, Yogeshvari, Derek Hansen, beautiful smile, beautiful beard. Thanks everyone. Uh, Kijai to Hanuman. Hare Krishna.